Hi, everyone. I'm uh, very pleased to welcome you to our fireside chat this morning on open source AI. Um, super thrilled to be joined by uh, David Hershey, who's a you know, VP on the Unusual Ventures team. Uh, my name is Waylon Dang. I'm a general partner here at Unusual Ventures focused on AI infrastructure software. Uh, and I'm thrilled to welcome uh, two uh, esteemed guest panelists. Um, so the first is uh, Vipul Ved Prakash. And so, you know, Vipul, uh, you know, comes from a background and a long track record as a serial founder. Uh, you know, he's founder of a company called Cloudmark and, and a founder called Topsy, which got acquired by Apple, um, after which he led uh, search and AI and ML efforts uh, over at Apple before uh, founding um, Together, uh, where he's now co-founder and CEO. And... Uh, you know, together is one of the, the prominent platforms building around open, you know, an open decentralized uh, AI cloud platform. Uh, and I'm also uh, super happy to welcome Reynolds Shin, uh, longtime uh, thought leader and contributor to uh, Apache Spark uh, and co-founder and chief architect at Databricks, where he's also been involved around efforts related to Dolly, uh, you know, an open source instruction following LLM that was recently announced. Vipul Reynolds, welcome. Hi. Thank you. Super happy to be here. Yeah, you know, super excited to be able to, you know, discuss and, and get into some of the, the details around, you know, what's going on with, you know, open source AI and, uh, you know, open LLMs. You know, one of the reasons why, you know, we felt this was you know really valuable and interesting topic to explore with you guys you know, today is because we've just seen tremendous you know, innovation and growth in what's happening with the open AI ecosystem. You know, if you look at the number of developers and end users who are utilizing, you know, open source AI technologies, if you look at what's been coming out from a research standpoint, you know, in terms of foundation models and other areas of the AI native stack, it's really astounding, you know, how quickly you know, things are moving. Um, and, and, you know, we at Unusual, we feel there's, um, we're at the early innings or beginning of, you know, the long-term impact that we're going to feel from, uh, you know, open, open source AI. And so I'd love to start off, you know, getting both of your perspectives, you know, around, you know, in the last several months, we've seen so many new models, like the, the Hugging Face Open LLM leaderboard is changing all the time. You know, and, and these include models that the, you know, your teams have trained. Like, you know, Vipple, you have Red Pajama from Together. Reynolds, you have Dolly. You know, I would love to start off by asking the both of you, you know, what do you believe is behind the recent wave of you know, open source LLMs and foundation models? And, and why is it important? So, you know, Vipple, you want, you want to kick off? We'd love to hear your perspective on, you know, what you think is happening. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, unlike the sort of last decade of deep learning, uh, where companies who had data, they sort of had this asymmetric advantage uh, in, in, in using AI. And uh, with LLMs, they are built on open data sets. So I, th I think it was a matter of time uh, and, and interest. And it's uh, really great to see, uh, see this happening. I, I think some of the sort of, uh, um, you know, research uh, for instance, the Chinchilla research on training optimal models and then Lama's work on inference optimal models have kind of enabled, uh, you know, training these models with sort of less hardware uh, and, uh, you know, really kind of get high quality. So that, that quality bar and threshold being hit, I think, is one of the reasons we are seeing, uh, seeing this interest. And... You know, I, I I think part of the interest in open source is that you can customize these models, you can run them in, you know, uh, sort of private environments where with sensitive data, uh, you, you have a lot more control over the weights. Uh, so there is a lot of interest in seeing these open models sort of become uh, better and you're you, you kind of you're seeing this ecosystem effect of multiple, um, you know, research labs and open source projects contributing to uh, contributing to the progress. Re Reynolds, we'll love, love to hear your your take on, on the topic. Yeah, I mean, it makes a lot of sense what Vipo said. I think there's in general sort of the technology and the data set and the compute power has become to the point that it's 
significantly easier to train uh, maybe the small language models. And that explains a lot of it. But I, I think we have to attribute maybe a lot of the sudden activity and interest in the last maybe three or four months to actually uh, open AI themselves for the release of ChatGPT, because that for the first time probably capture um, or got everybody to wake up um, and think about, hey, AI seem to be a big deal. I'm not talking about everybody like will be calling into a webinar like this, but rather so if your your mothers, your fathers, who might not be in tech, who might be too, <laughs> who might not be in tech. Uh, like my mom has nothing to do with tech and she's been using ChatGPT all the time. Um, and so is the CEO of corporate America and all of this. Um, so people that uh, I would say would be able to influence the directions and they really are pushing, I would say the community for. And the other thing is because there's nothing that gathers, I would say the community behind um, when there is a very obvious uh, target and target here doesn't necessarily try to destroy it, but just trying to like, Hey, let's, let's maybe catch up. This, if there's a big gap, there's nothing that exists in open source. Let's actually try to uh, get something out there. I think that definitely had a pretty significant impact, especially um, in the last few months. And that's really where you saw the activity started um, uh, to accelerate, which is around probably like late February, early March. And then uh, between the, um, then and now, you see a massive uh, sort of momentum of um, opportunities and activities. Cool. Um, I just take a moment. I, I see I see folks, uh, you know, in, in the chat kind of introducing themselves. I would invite, you know, anyone during the discussion to submit, you know, questions that we'll cover for, with Reynolds and Vipul uh, at, at the end of the discussion, uh, sort of an open Q&A. You know, kind of to go off of something that you just said, you know, Vipul, which is, you know, a big part of the you know, attraction around open source models is, you know, you can customize them, you can make them, you know, extensible in some sense. I'm, I'm curious, like, you know, bo both of you guys work at companies that have built platforms, though, to support running those models. Like, you know, what do you think, you know, certainly there's innovation in the models themselves, you know, but, w w with, you know, I'm curious, like, how you felt, like, having that platform to ac actually be able to serve you know, customers running, you know, who want to run the models, how that factored in, like, why did each of you get, you know, decide to build around open source, as opposed to certainly there are proprietary platforms out there as well, like, fundamentally, like, how did, you know, each of your, your companies think about it? Um, Re Reynold, do you want, you want to start off? Sure. Um, for us, it's not a exclusive or um, it's like, it's fine for us to be using something proprietary, but at the same time, actually be supporting the open source ecosystem. And really, the, the reason Dolly was started was not that we felt, hey, we have to build a state-of-the-art model. It was really, initially, it started as a very simple goal, which is, hey, let's try to learn about this and see how far we can get. And then very quickly, we realized, um, hey, there's actually a lot of large uh, open source, large language models out there that did not have instruction following the capabilities that the GPT has demonstrated. Can we actually take an existing model and for very little amount of money actually fine tune it. So um, it, it would exhibit some of the instruction following behavior. And it, it took us actually the first version of Dolly about three days from the inception of the idea to training to actually making a blog post about it. Um, so it was actually a very, very short period. <clears throat> and then we realized, hey, we should be telling the story. And the point of the story is actually not what a lot of people thought it would be, which is, hey, they're trying to like challenge open AI and, coming up with amazing language models. The point of story is to demonstrate, hey, it is actually not that hard. If you want to train something that's for your specific domain, it's really, really difficult to build a very general purpose chatbot that can talk about anything in the world. But it's actually not that hard. If you want to build a domain specific model, um, as a matter of fact, here's all the ingredients you need um, to, to actually get there. And that's basically how Dolly came about. Um, it wasn't really, hey, um, let's build something state of the art, but it's, hey, let's demonstrate to the world that it's possible. And then uh, we quickly followed up. Once we released Dolly 1.0, um, one of the big challenge was, hey, you can't actually use it in a commercial setting because the data set they trained on did not have the permissive license because we're using OpenAI to generate those data sets. So we did this Dolly 2.0 follow up in about two weeks. It would just ask every employee at Databricks to write some questions and answers. And that generated a Dolly 15K data set. Um, that were also open source. And so to be honest, I think the Dolly 15 data set itself is far more valuable 
than the Dolly model because the data set will become so part of the training corpus pro probably for the thousands or even the millions of uh, open source models to come. Um, and and it wouldn't be the only training data set would become a part of that. Um, and that's for far everlasting. And this is sort of our little contribution to the world here. Well, that, that's an interesting sort of segue. <laughs> Riff will be curious to get your perspective because, you know, on, for the notion of a data set, I mean, you, you guys obviously put out the red pajama data set, you know, and, and thought about, you know, that as a key starting point and sort of the, the open nature seems foundational to what, you know, to, you know, together is building, but we'd love to kind of hear your perspective on, you know, how, how you decided or why you decided to build around open source. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think uh, uh, echoing Reynolds, you know, Dolly, uh, 15 k is this incredible data set I think has uh, in many ways I, I do think data has this enduring power uh, over time uh, in in uh, open source uh, uh, models because you you will see you know changes in architectures and um, more efficient architectures uh, come up over time and they will uh, sort of build around the data ecosystem that has been created in the open. So we think that's really important. It's, um, uh, you know, also some of the, I've seen some of the talks that uh, uh, Databricks has done around how they created the data set, which I think is also super, super interesting because you can now sort of replicate this process in, in, in a different setting. Uh, and that's how we are thinking about uh, kind of pre-training data is, it's very important that you have the speed training data because it enables, you know, um, downstream model building. Uh, it's also very important that the recipes to generate these, uh, generate the data are open and available because, you know, uh, you can take those recipes, uh, um, use them for another language. You can improve the data set quality over time. Uh, and it, from, from the perspective of, uh, you, you know, folks building models and exploring, uh, you know, uh, architectures or data mixtures, it just, uh, you know, it really speeds up that process to have a data set that's been carefully prepared. Uh, and, you know, in, in the future, we want to do a lot more around this where uh, there's a data set, but there's also sort of quality labels and uh, content type labels. So you have this bigger data playground to work with. Uh, and you, you sort of see this with Pile. Pile has become, you know, really central to uh, uh, innovation and in, in open AI and research, and it's going to be pretty important. I, I, I do believe that over the next few years, the work around data will be sort of, you know, cornerstone of improvements. You know, we're seeing the results of, you know, um, and the impact of these data sets, you know, in the in these new models now. And I, I'm curious, you know, there's all these leader, you know, there's these leaderboards, you know, there's these rankings, you know, that that people, you know, are, are paying attention to. What what do you think is is missing from them? Like, what would you say, you know, isn't captured necessarily in, you know, these these lists, these rankings, you know, uh, even some of the benchmarks that are being used to generate uh, the, the the leaderboards. Um, we would be curious to, you know, kind of unpack that a bit with with, uh, with you guys. Uh, you know, Vipul, you wanna? Yeah, I mean, uh, one, I think it's a it's a good process. It's uh, also, you know, it's also fun for for people who are doing uh, uh, building model that sets up some, you know, uh, friendly competitive dynamics, and it's uh, really sort of acting as a North Star for, for progress. Um, you know, that said, I do think the benchmarks are, uh, need to be much more principled than they are today. Uh, you often see, you know, differences when people try to reproduce these benchmarks uh, outside of uh, the leaderboards. There's a research from University of Edinburgh that showed that, uh, you know, the Lama 7B is still like five, six points ahead of all the uh, Red Pajama and uh, Falcon and MPT uh, base models. Uh, so I, I, I think we need need a lot more rigor uh, around benchmarking because it is sort of driving and shaping what uh, researchers are doing. Um, I think there are also 
a part of that rigor is, you know, processes around decontamination from data sets, uh, from, from benchmark data sets, like they'll sometimes be included in, you know, GitHub code and, and they may end up in the, in the, in the models and making the data open kind of allows uh, a lot of that process to happen. Um, but I, I think a lot more work needs to be done. I, evaluation is fairly difficult from, you know, uh, new research around how to evaluate these models and new processes. Reynold, you know, uh, yeah. you have to hear your perspective on, you know, how, how should people make sense of these leaderboards? So in a different world, I mean, which is the data systems world, um, benchmarks are very, very important. And people have that they're like benchmark experts who spend their entire life doing nothing but designing benchmarks. Um, and we're so early in this process on the uh, large language model side that I think, uh, first of all, it's great to see them. I do think the ultimate benchmark are the ones that you uh, just have unbiased humans that rate the uh, answers and you have a large number of them. That's how some of this leaderboards work. But I think one of the uh, big challenge, honestly, I don't know how to solve is that they tend to be fairly simple. Um, and many of the applications of uh, this large language models is not going to be super simple. So having fairly simplistic setups with humans just asking simple questions and rating the answers represent only a very, very narrow slice of what this large language models would be used for. And they tend not to be domain specific, which I think a lot of the LLMs will be used for domain specific applications. And it's just going to be difficult to uh, take, hey, here's what maybe 10,000 random people on the internet think about the responses versus, hey, here's like what doctors would think about uh, this type of responses. As a matter of fact, they might not even ask the right questions um, on the open internet. And that, that is one of the things I think, um, which also draws to how, so how do you think about evaluation of the models? Um, and I think just like any machine learning problem, LMs are no, no different. You kind of need a continuous iterative improvement process. You shouldn't just trust, hey, here's a benchmark. Let me pick the number one place in that um, and start using it. You know, we're, we're I, you know, I think many of us would say we're we're still early, and there's so, you know, many models out there. I know both both of you are, you know, you know Chris Ray at Stanford, and you know he's kind of likened where we are to sort of AI's Linux moment. You know, and I think if you analogize, you know, there there were many Linux, you know, variations of Linux distributions that, you know, existed early on. Like, but eventually that consolidated. And do do you think long term we'll see eventual, you know, industry consolidation? Like, or do, you know, does it make sense to have so many open LLMs and and foundation models? I'm curious to. I mean, obviously, like, there's an aspect where people have more choice and so on. But I think there's also something you said for more standardization and, and people coalescing around, you know, fewer. Um, I'm, I'm curious how each of you thinks about that. Um, you know, Vipul? Yeah, I think, um, I, I do think there will be consolidation uh, eventually. I think there's a long way to go. Um, uh, you know, there is going to be, uh, uh, you know, new architectures, uh, explosion of new strategies. That's That's going to happen in the uh, coming years, and you will see, uh, you know, uh, sort of a variety of models, um, and, and models will, and research labs will start sort of adopting and investing in particular approaches. Uh, you are seeing, you know, I, I think there are signs that there will be consolidation, for instance, today with uh, the Llama architecture, the amount of tooling that's built around it is, you know, is becoming, you know, substantial. And when you're building a new model, it uh, does make more sense to sort of adopt that architecture because now all of this tooling just automatically works. Uh, and, and that may be one of the ways in which consolidation happens. It happens around uh, happens around architectures. But, you know, as Ronald was saying, we're very early uh, in this process and uh, I would, uh, you know, once there are better models, users will gravitate towards them. And that's uh, sort of the highest value thing in some ways. Reynold, any 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 thoughts on, you know, long-term consolidation versus... Yeah, I, I basically 100% agree with what people said. I think consolidation is 
um, necessary and bound to happen, just like any technology. There will be that said doesn't mean there will be no no more than three open source models. Likely follow some sort of ZVM distribution. Okay, here's like a few of their wildly popular that basically people start with. Um, and the uh, but there might still be innovations that's happening over time. The disruptors that come in replace them and. But is it going to happen next year? Is it going to happen like five, ten years from now? Uh, I suspect it's more on the latter side. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's to some extent it's not super useful to speculate exactly what would happen um, here because the uh, it's just the space is innovating so quickly that all you need to know is you have to be ready to embrace the change. Great. Um I want to shift gears a bit, um, and before that, I just want to remind the audience, you know, feel free to submit any questions that you have, uh, which we'll cover at the end of uh, the discussion. You know, Vipul, one topic that you and I have chatted about is, you know, the, the impact of research and the fact that a lot of what's happening in the ecosystem, and, and even from a standpoint of building things like LLM apps, you know, ends up being research driven right now. Now, both of you, you know, have worked across, you know, academic labs and large tech companies, and, and we've seen things come out of those, like, for instance, you know, Llama from Meta and, you know, you know, work from Stanford, Berkeley and other universities. I'm curious, you know, what do you think the role of, you know, academic labs and large tech companies and, you know, these different stakeholders is in, you know, uh, alongside, you know, companies like yourselves, like, you know, driving, you know, driving the innovation forward? Um, you know, I, I, I would say that uh, uh, I think in computer science, this has always been the case that, uh, you know, academia is experimenting with the crazier ideas, which are then adopted by industry and industry then produces sort of industrialized artifacts uh, uh, from those ideas. And then you know, there's a cycle of uh, uh, academia looking at that and kind of innovating further. I think that's very much the case in um, AI. There is, a, you know, an incredible amount of, uh, you know, scholarship and research that's happening in academic labs. And that's sort of making its way into, uh, into the industry. Uh, and, uh, you know, industry sort of doing scale up of some of these ideas, uh, which, uh, 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 you know, I think it's, it's a very sort of uh, uh, productive, productive cycle. And uh, this is one of the reasons, you know, at Together, we are uh, collaborating fairly deeply with academic labs, uh, uh, especially given, you know, um, open source is a very sort of friendly way of doing this, this sort of collaboration. Um, but I think, yeah, academia has a has a huge role to play, and 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 so does industry. Yeah, I mean, it, it would seem like you know, you, you, both of your companies actually have been you know, real leaders in you know fostering and figuring out ways to collaborate across academia and and industry. You know, I mean, you know, Vipul, you work with Percy Young at Stanford, and you know, Reynolds, your your colleagues, and you know, Matei at you know, Stanford. And so I think it's interesting to, to, to observe how you well, are co founders are still professors. And, uh, sure. Sure. Members. sure. Um, and so, you know, I think it's been interesting to see kind of like the uh, cross pollination between, you know, the, you know, academia and, uh, and what's going on with companies like yourselves, you know, in, in this context. Um, you know, Ren Rendell, I, I'm curious to get, you know, hear your opinion on, you know, what do you see as some of the most significant innovations, you know, coming out of the, the research, you know, community and the research side of things that, you know, perhaps you guys and, and others are looking to, to productize? Yeah. Um, so the, so one caveat, there's so many new things are coming out every day that it's actually becoming very difficult to track even for me. Uh, but Actually, touching on maybe your uh, last question to the poll, well, I think one of the skepticism towards academia has been brewing recently in, in terms of AI is that, hey, AI requires a lot of compute power and access to data, which academia right. does not typically have. Does that mean the role of, sort of academic research is uh, diminished in the uh, era of large language models, especially? Um, I mean, I would challenge that assumption um, and just talking about, hey, saw the interesting work. 
Um, and one thing about the past is the very obvious example, which people often don't realize, is stable diffusion, which is one of the most popular, maybe not a lot language model, one of the most popular AI models, came out of latent diffusion work um, in academia. The, um, and that, that's something that's had a remarkable, profound impact in the industry. Um, the, the LM stuff, I think it's a little bit newer. It needs a lot of attention. There are people in there that's working on large language models, even in academia for a while. Um, but a lot of attention is newer. And um, I, I think maybe two things I, I've seen that recently is pretty exciting is one, uh, it's actually not by academic research, but by a bunch of former academics at Mosaic. Uh, so Mosaic ML is MPT's long context window, which actually I think uh, allows up to 84K if I remember correctly, on uh, context window, which is, which is pretty remarkable. It's actually even longer than GDP4s. Um, the other thing is, um, we, we all know that one of the most biggest issues that LLMs they hallucinate is sometimes they would make up APIs, they would make up facts that are just completely wrong, um, which is problematic when you want to, for example, hey, use a large language model to facilitate um, integration orchestration of systems. Um, and I've seen recently the guerrilla work in UC Berkeley by Joey, uh, Joey Gonzalez's team. Um, that um, basically combine retrieval based systems to, to hey, here's like a perfect API calling LM that always makes sure I'm calling the right APIs or passing in the right parameters. I don't hallucinate on the API out. And I think work like that, maybe not the specific incarnation of it, but the work like this will uh, actually push the application of large language models a pretty long way. And, and then, you know, maybe one other question with regards to research is, you know, both, both of you highlighted you know, the central role of, of data, you know, um, earlier in the conversation. You know, our observation has been a lot of the innovation in, you know, development of LLMs, you know, has centered on improving input data. But, you know, curious, like, what innovations do, do both of you see uh, or expect with regards to training data, you know, would you look to in terms of moving the space forward? Um, Vipul, you want to take that one first? Yeah, I, I think one of the uh, was a recent paper from Stanford uh, called Doremi uh, that's sort of looking at how to, in a principal way, weight different data slices that go into uh, data sets. I think this uh, can have a potentially huge impact. Uh, with Red Pajama, there are seven different slices of data from seven different sources. Uh, they are weighted according to, you know, we weighted them according to the LAMA paper, but when we uh, reweight them in different ways, we find that the downstream models have, you know, significantly different, better quality. So I think work around that, very excited about, about it. You can also take some of the large, you know, data sets like common crawl and, and split them further and, and, and reweight them. Um, and, you know, I think there's also questions of deduplication, how, how much deduplication is right and what's sort of the, the sweet spot for it. Uh, there's research around that uh, fairly, I think, fairly leveraged in terms of the, the quality that you can get out of the same data and the same sort of model architecture. Uh, and I think instruct data is, uh, you know, a huge uh, area for for improvement. We uh, the red pajama model, seven billion model, you see seven points of, uh, you know, a difference in uh, on Helm benchmarks. And seven points is amazing. It's the difference between sort of Llama and GPT-3 today. And that comes from, uh, you know, uh, a set of instruct data, including the, the work that, that Databricks has done with Dolly. So I uh, think that uh, increasing the data set and understanding what kind of data makes models better uh, it it's, uh, uh, will have a big impact, and, and there's a lot of research happening around that. Thanks, Paul. You know, R Randall, any any thoughts on you know where where you kind of take training data going forward? Yeah, my sense is thanks to the work of everybody and us playing a very very small part. Honestly, would be more the companies like together and all that playing the bigger part is uh, the training data for open source will be or training data for foundational models will be commoditized over time everybody will have access to more or less the same set of data sets um the like with reasonable amount of money not like insane amount of money um and then there will be a, a lot of the maybe competitive advantage will be coming on hey when we talk about domain specific things 
What about, about my data? What about how my customer has been interacting with me in the past? Um, and those will become, uh, and so the ability to exploit and leverage those will become maybe competitive differentiations for most of the domain specific use cases. This is again, my, my thesis is most companies or organizations are not trying to build a general chatbot that can converse about everything from philosophy to state of the art technology. Most companies have certain applications that want to put the LMC use for. And uh, data specifically um, relevant to those um, are going to be the key. And those are not the ones that will be available on the open internet. And those are also not the ones that OpenAI would have, Google would have. It's rather you as your organization would have those data. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand off to David now. He's gonna cover a topic that I would say is really sort of top of mind for our audience, which is you know how to I think about building with these open source models. And, you know, I think part of that is how, you know, companies like Together and Databricks are enabling, you know, people to build uh, on top of, uh, you know, the, the models that you've, you know, trained and made available. Um, so David, you want to, you want to take it from here? Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, let's get started by asking you all about how you think about when teams should choose open source models and the trade off they make. So, so maybe, for example, you touched on it in your intro at the beginning, but I'm just curious in your mind, what is pushing teams to adopt open source models as opposed to some of the proprietary endpoints? And what trade offs do you think they can make in that journey? Yeah, I, I, you know, I would say there are several reasons. Uh, a, a big one is control and privacy. Uh, the data that they are using for um, is, is sensitive, and it's not appropriate to send to uh, you know shared shared cloud SaaS type API. Um, you know, we also see that uh, when you when you fine tune these models, you're getting you know 10, 12 points of uh, uh, accuracy, and so the transfer learning works really well. Uh, and people are realizing that they're often using smaller models. We've seen uh, we have several several uh, customers have used three billion and seven billion models, uh, and either continue to pre-train them or fine-tune them, and then use them with few shot contexts uh, to get uh, accuracy, you know, better accuracy than GPT-4. Uh, so we are. I, I think that process of uh, anyone who has, as Daniel was saying, their own data and 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 has a, you know, sense of what are the tasks they are using uh, uh, the language model for, are uh, really have now the tool set to you know build something on their own and get high quality and control over it. Yeah, maybe to Ronald uh, to piggyback off that, I think one of the nice things about the proprietary endpoints is you don't really have to think about the data challenge. And so some of the teams that may have been benefited by managing data before might like see this as scary. And I'm curious, you went down the route of building this big instruction tuning data set with your company, but if you have advice or thoughts on what it actually means to build data that you can use and data sets that you can use to tune these models, to fine tune models, to instruction tune models, whatever it is, um, for folks that maybe are engineers just getting into the data space? I think it's actually maybe less about how you think about the data here. It's a lot more about how do you think about evaluation of uh, like ML ops or evaluation of your machine learning models, which large language models are part of. Like some people when you say machine learning, they'll think of large language models. When they say AI, they do uh, confuse the hell out of me, but the uh, when I say ML, it's kind of equivalent to AI here. The what what I would argue what really you want to is just like any system you build, you want a way to evaluate it, right? If for a non-machine learning system, you evaluate based on SLAs, you look at uptime, you look at uh, you look at a lot of things. Your regression analysis is no different when it comes to machine learning models. You want some way to evaluate how effective it is in production. Um, and the reason that is important is I can guarantee you whatever you deploy, even if just calling OpenAI's REST endpoint, um, is not going to be perfect. And there's a massive room for improvement through prompt engineering. Um, what you want is you want to be able to evaluate, you want to come up with some metrics that make sense in your domain specific context and evaluate that. You want to log the response, the answers, 
um, you want to be able to tell, evaluate after the fact, hey, how am I actually doing? Instead of just, hey, here's like a new pile of code that gets rolled out in production. Um, and then you want to improve upon that and you want to run experiments. Um, all of this are very standard things for anybody that's been doing applied machine learning. Um, they've been doing this for the last 10 years. Um, a lot of them are done with bespoke tooling that doesn't exist uh, maybe in uh, so commercial settings or open source settings. Um, the open source ecosystem and the vendors are trying to catch up really, really quickly. So you don't have to be building all of this custom bespoke tooling in order to be doing this. Um, the, but, but ultimately, what you really want to think of them as a optimization problem, but there's some metrics I'll be defining and how do I improve that metric over time? Um, and that's what's going to, I think, maybe sort of differentiate the more successful deployments um, and the less successful deployments, how your ability to actually continuously improve and innovate over time. Um, and from that perspective, it doesn't really matter if you're just calling open AI, you should deploy on your own. As a matter of fact, you think of them as model agnostic. You think of it as, hey, maybe I'm starting with say open AI, but once I have enough actual answer responses um, that would make sense, I know how to evaluate, I want to experiment and try out different open source models and I'll actually fine tune some of them. And by the way, it's actually gotten significantly easier. Um, it's not voodoo magic. You don't need a PhD in machine learning to be doing it. Um, anybody could read up a tutorial and cobble together some tooling. It's harder to make it production quality, but it's not that hard. Um, so th that's really what I think people should be focusing on. Yeah, I, I maybe want to pick up off of that and touch on this team thing. And you talked about not necessarily needing a PhD anymore. And I think that's really important. To me, one of the more interesting things that's happened with language models is a lot of software engineers that never really have been scared of machine learning in the past have adopted the endpoint version of this and feel like they can do things. And what I'd love to hear from you all is uh, what types of teams you've seen adopting open source models so far? And, and is it ML PhDs? Is it ML engineers? Is it software engineers that are learning to fine tune? Um, yeah, I would just love to... Like, if you've talked to some of your users and gotten a sense of, of what skill sets are out there that are allowing people to fine tune models, I would love to hear more about it, maybe starting with Bibble. Yeah, I mean, we are seeing, uh, as Sam was saying, a lot of folks who do not have a background in machine learning have now access to these tools. There's documentation, uh, there's you know videos on how to uh, do fine tuning on uh, you know, your, your, the hardware that's available to you. And we're seeing a lot of that uh, is, uh, uh, it's fairly interesting. I would also say uh, in the sort of domain of few shot and in context learning sort of prompt engineering, we often see, uh, you know, uh, people do things that our, our research team looks at and says, oh, wow, that's amazing. Like we, we never thought this was possible. So there's this entire, it opens up I think an area of creativity uh, and, and a particular style of almost like programming these models, uh, which is uh, you know fairly accessible to to programmers who have sort of programmed different kinds of systems, and I expect that this will become more and more of a norm as tooling improves and uh, you know understanding about how to uh, uh, really kind of drive and and tune these models. Uh, I. I you know, with on, 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 on our platform today, I would say 80% of the customers are not ML uh, PhDs. Yeah, we're seeing something very similar, which is most of the, especially in the last few months, there's a lot more people that have never done machine learning in the past or applied machine learning now coming on board. So just playing with large language models. Um, and as a matter of fact, the first priority now is large language models. Um, even if all they've been doing in the past is ETL pipelines. Um, to some extent, I felt like acad academia kind of failed maybe a whole generation here by making, if you go take a machine learning class, the first thing you learn is linear algebra. It's like more linear algebra, more matrix multiplications, which kind of makes the thing sound very scary. This is equivalent to, hey, if I, you want to learn any programming, start with transistors um, and understand the physics behind them in order to actually like learn any Pearl or uh, Ruby, <laughs> uh, Python, right? The, that's not how people learn programming. Uh, I think, yes, if you want to learn how to maybe think about design the next architecture, 
Um, you might have to understand all the math behind it, but really, I think there's a lot of the apply side of that that uh, should be dumbed down substantially and also gets easier with uh, better tooling. I, uh, I, that, I agree. Uh, as someone who took those linear algebra classes, <laughs> it certainly scared me at the time. So, um, I mean, this I, I love to... a bunch of APIs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, I'd love to close the Q and A or, or the the conversational bit of this by thinking a little bit about uh, the future and where we see this open source ecosystem going. And so uh, maybe I'll go to each of you and ask just how you see the open source language model ecosystem evolving over the next few years. I know there's sort of a GPT-4 looming in the distance somewhere, uh, but I'm curious which routes and, and where you see development uh, really taking off. Maybe start with Reynold. Um, I, I think you get to the point that the for most domain specific applications, you don't need, like I think the world will realize for domain specific applications, you don't need hundreds of billions or trillions of parameters, parameters probably going to standardize somewhere in the low or double digit billions. Um, and then there will be commoditized open source foundational models, a few of them that people choose from. Um, but what the key is, you kind of have to train and fit for your, uh, um, your specific domain. And that's how we see so the, basically everybody that even starts with, hey, let's just call it an open AI endpoint or some Azure endpoint. Um, they, when they, once they start doing evaluation, they realize, hey, it might actually be cheaper, more cost effective, um, let alone any privacy issues, um, and maybe even more effective um, if I were to just do some fine tuning based on my own context. And I think that's um, probably most of the world will actually realize for serious applications, they are domain specific. That's probably going to be the way to go. And a lot of those would be, like, almost all of those would be powered by the open source model. Bibble, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I believe that the open source ecosystem will will be a bit the bigger ecosystem in this. Uh, I, I think there's a place for both closed and open models. You know, I, I, I do think, you know, in if you're sort of looking at a, a you know, two year horizon, uh, I, I do think frontier models will be open source. I, I, I think there is just an incredible amount of ecosystem interest in uh, advancing this technology. And, um, you know, you'll see that ecosystem interest coalesce into, uh, you know, uh, groups that are able to build uh, uh, frontier models and uh, they will exist. I mean, so that's Randall was saying, it's already sort of happened in text to image. And, uh, you know, they are smaller models and, and we have to compute for it. Uh, but we are putting together compute for these larger builds that I think will, um, um, uh, you know, eventually turn into uh, very competitive uh, technologies. Awesome. Uh, Wei, I'll hand it back to you and maybe we can uh, transition to answer some of the questions we've gotten from the audience. Thanks, David. Um, you know, Vipul Vran, I think it's been really interesting discussion. Just to you know, get your perspective on you know, how to make sense of what's been going on, you know, with these open source foundation models, you know, and perhaps you know some of the things that we can expect you know, going forward. Um, a few, few questions I wanted to uh, receive from the audience. That I wanted to, to pose to each of you. you know, maybe the starting one is is actually one that we hear a lot um, as people are. You're just starting to, you know, set out to build in this in this ecosystem and, and figuring out, you know, what's a good place to start. And so, first question is, you know, given there's been an explosion of so many models, you know, do you have any recommendations on, you know, what, you know, which one or or where, you know, which are the, you know, ones that make sense to start with? Like, which would be a good ones to start to experiment with and, and play around with? Um, I mean, of course, there, there's the ones that. You know, each of your companies are, 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 you know, making available, but I'm curious, you know, beyond that, like just generally, like, how do you guys think about that? Like what advice do you have for AI builders out there in terms of what open models to potentially start with? Uh, Vipul, you want to take yeah. that first? You know, I think uh, one sort of <coughs> one decision is uh, the size of the model, because that has impact on performance and, uh, you know, 
picking something. We have great models now at three billion, at seven billion, at uh, uh, forty billion parameters that can serve as uh, bases for for your application. Uh, so I would I would sort of look at that, and that often. Um, you know, if you can, with the smallest model, achieve your application goals, uh, you know, that's, that's sort of the best in terms of performance. I mean, these are still expensive uh, uh, models to run, uh, and uh, it, it, that should be a factor. But you also want to try multiple models at times and see whether, uh, 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 you know, which of them perform <laughs> better on your tasks it's uh and your tasks may not be captured by the standard benchmarks that exist uh, uh so i think i think picking the size and then and trying a few different models that you know rank well on that uh parameter count Re reynold well you know what would you say in terms of yeah. you know, wh which which ones start with from, so from I, I pasted in a link into the chat um or if you just google best in class open source generative ai model through free commercial use you can find because we've been asked literally hundreds of thousands of times this question <laughs> in the last few months uh, we created a web page for it um it actually has a table <laughs> listed along so the use case on one dimension do you want quality do you want speed which is re related to cost um and um you, you, once you look at it if you wish you should trust us because we don't even recommend dolly uh, we don't even recommend our own models it's a very unbiased opinion based on our experience um working with actually there's thousands of like different companies that are building large language model applications on databricks now um just based on our experience working with them um and that's this page gets updated so every month because there's so many new things that come out very quickly. Um, so uh, just take a look at that. That's our recommendation. Question for you, Reynold. Um, you know, next one is, you know, this person says, you know, I, I'm interested in understanding best practices, you know, and, and methods for parameter, parameterizing models correctly at the outset and how to ensure, you know, continuously monitor their performance and relevance over time. Um, any, any sort of, you know, guiding advice uh, with regards to, to that topic? Yeah, I, I think um, one of the things is um, d don't think of large language model as something like new that never existed before. Think of it as an applied machine learning problem. So a lot of lessons from applied machine learning like applies here. Um, there are frameworks we built in the past, like for example, MLflow, we're updating it to actually introduce a lot of large language model specific things to make it easier for LMs. Um, and this includes how do you do experiments? How do you track them? How do you actually lock responses? Um, we'll be announcing a lot of stuff also next week at our Data and AI Summit conference um, to make a lot of this stuff easier. Um, but, but in general, I would say think of it as a applied machine learning problem in which uh, you, you, you shouldn't, uh, maybe the key is to think of the model as something that's very likely you want to update multiple times even if you're just calling a REST endpoint, that's still a model. Um, it's something very likely you'll be updating uh, many times. So think of it as a, a be agile there and abstract away what the model is. I was joking with uh, Matei the other day that I think there's going to be 100,000 model endpoint abstractions that will be built by different companies um, in the next year because everybody will be following this device and everybody will realize hey, there's nothing standard out there. Let me build a new one. Uh, I'm pretty sure they will be open source standard <laughs> this very soon uh, because there's no point. It's not like a secret sauce for anybody. There's no point building 100,000 of them. Um, so I, I think uh, think of it from that perspective. So one, uh, treat it as apply ML prom and look at best practices from apply ML. Second, very importantly, think of model um, API, the abstract away the model API so you can actually swap it in now. And the model API might be a little bit deeper than you think. It also includes how does it do logging. It's not just hey, response uh, request response pair. It's a little bit more um, involved in it. Cool. Maybe you know one one last question to to wrap up you know this chat this morning for for each of you is you know certainly the the potential and capabilities of these models have have captured the the public's you know and the mainstream public's imagination. Um, there's certainly a lot of discussion around, 
you know, standards and, and, you know, guiding principles, you know, do, do you, you know, do each of you believe that, you know, what are your thoughts on, you know, producing a set of, you know, guidelines and not necessarily a regulatory framework, but, you know, guidelines and, and industry norms and best practices for guiding the development of these models going forward. How, how do you, how do you each of you think about that? And, you know, how, how would, each of your companies actually potentially, you know, contribute and have a role in that. Um, Vipul, you want to go first? Um, you know, the way I, we, we think about it, I think it's important. And there's been a lot of, uh, uh, you know, in media, the, the sort of dangers of AI and, uh, uh, and those dangers, you know, because of that models have to be regulated. I think it's very important to, uh, sort of not overstate those and have, you know, real uh, 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 sort of describe what the uh, potential, you know, concrete issues are. And I think a, a lot of these are very application specific. Uh, you, you know, if you're building models that are being used to generate uh, fiction and help uh, uh, Hollywood with script writing, it probably has a very different set of standards and rules than a model that's being used to, you know, approve mortgage applications, for instance. So I, I, I think uh, I, my view on this today is that uh, the guidelines sort of need to be sectorial rather than sort of universal guidelines on models. And uh, uh, other than that, it doesn't really sort of make a lot of sense to treat, uh, um, you know, uh, treat these models as like dangerous artifacts today, which I, I, I think the conversation around that is significantly overblown and uh, in, in some ways possibly, uh, you know, also a way to kind of get regulatory uh, 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 sort of protection around uh, big models from companies whose business models are dependent on uh, the larger models being, you know, scarce. Yeah, absolutely. I'm hundred percent agree. It's, it's bizarre that there is sort of a doomsday, but I do see a lot of potential issues. Like for example, um, it's probably much easier to spread misinformation because now they sound real. They sound even more real than in the past, um, with generative AI, the, but in general, so I think some amount of regulation can be good. Like, GDPR, despite very painful, I think it's a good thing. Um, the EU is actually working on the UAI Act. Um, the 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 so I have the big warning sign I would put on is, um, as the poll kind of hinted at the end, um, it is actually in many of the largest companies' uh, best interest to uh, sort of have this be even more regulated because regulation means the cost of innovation goes up. Um, so the, uh, the, one of the easiest way to stifle innovation in the open source ecosystem is by making it very, very difficult to produce, um, and train open source models because there's so many things you have to follow and that would dramatically cut down the amount of actual innovation. Um, so we have to be very, very careful in regulation, uh, in terms of overly regulate too early. Um, this is the field that is the, the very, I think, so the, uh, inception of it and uh we cannot so regulate innovation out of uh, this and there's only a few this is probably the only time you see a few large companies actively lobbying for regulation in tech because they feel like they are one of the few um that could afford the regulation right now well vipul reynold thank you so much for joining us today for this you know really fascinating discussion around open source ai appreciate your insights and your perspective uh, and hearing about what each of your companies together and Databricks are doing in the space. And thank you to, uh, you know, thank you to our audience for, for tuning in. Um, you know, if you'd like to discuss, you know, this topic around, you know, open, you know, open source, you know, AI and, you know, infrastructure and foundation models in particular, feel free to get in touch. Otherwise we, we all look forward to seeing what's ahead for, for all of us. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Have, have a great day. Thank you both. Bye.